المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد صدق الله رسوله يا بالحق أتدخلنا المسجد الحرام إن شاء الله آمين وحلقين الرؤوس من القصين لا تخافون صدق الله العظيم الله وسلم على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبعد رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقة من لسان يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله اللهم إني نسألك خير بكل ما سألك به عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعبادك الصالحون Brothers and sisters in Islam Jazakallah for staying behind for this final of our three series, Halaqa series and today inshallah it will be a short Halaqa approximately 30 minutes and we'll be covering the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Madhiyat al-Munawwara up to his final journey to his Rabb Jalla wa'ala and what I mean by his final journey it was really his death as it is described in the Quran Allah Muhammad illa Rasul قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ Verily this ayah when it was revealed the Sahaba they were aware of this ayah but Umar رضي الله he says that when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم left this world it was as if it was the first time I had seen this ayah or read this ayah. It was such a great event in the life of the Muslims in Medina that he had, they hadn't took notice of the of this ayah. And it happens as, as Muslims when we read the Quran from time to time, from time, to time we miss some portions and we think that it's not there. But when the need arises, we go back to the Quran and we find these solutions to our problems, to our issues that we are facing. And there are many issues which I started to talk about a few weeks ago, uh, before I delve into the, uh, the Sira, the Halaqa. You know, one of them which I mentioned a few weeks ago was the issue of inheritance. And there is a, a, a great long passage in the Holy Quran, Surah al nisa which talks about inheritance, the rights of the mother, the father, the daughter, the sister, the son, and even going as far as the, the sons and the, the daughters uh, from the distance, from the, from the rida'ah. And this is something which is clear in the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But yet, we still fail to give the hukuk, the rights to our sisters, our daughters, our mothers, and we prefer the like it was in the Jahili time. We prefer the, the males over the females. We think that they are going to be our ticket to Jannah, but verily the situation has changed in our times. You know, nowadays we see the situation with, amongst our youth, especially the males. It is really frightening. You know, we are seeing. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the fitans which are arising amongst our youth, it is immense. May Allah protect us and our youth from all these fitan. May Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for us to understand the deen better in order that we become clear in our minds, inshallah wa ta'ala. So we, we go straight into the topic. And there are two other topics which I will touch upon, inshallah, in the coming uh, few weeks. One of them is the issue of um, the marriage and how we are to uh, confront this issue. And one important uh, topic which is going to be covered next week, inshallah, is by our external speaker, the issue of riba, usually, usually, interest. How do you deal with this uh, massive issue? And it is really one of the major sins of Islam, and it is one of the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has become war against. So this is, I encourage you to come and participate in this event next week, inshallah. It will be uh, before Isha, but uh, after Maghrib straight away. So it is a two hour. Uh, seminar, inshallah, and you will benefit a lot, inshallah, from this event. So moving on, Ambabad. So we reached up to the point of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam approximately six years after the Hijrah. And there are two main uh, battles which took place in, the, in this year prior to the Sunha Hadibiyah. I mentioned a few weeks ago that Sunha Hadibiyah was a turning point for the Muslims in the fact that the hostilities, you know, decreased a lot. Rather than increasing the, the, the hostilities, actually some scholars say they completely stopped, but there were still small uh, skirmishes happening around Medina, which we will get into uh, during the, the Halaqa inshallah. But today I'm not going to uh, discuss the, the departure or the final journey of Rasulullah So we're going to leave this for a special day, maybe in the month of Rabi Thani or maybe in the month following that, but I will inshallah announce it uh, in due time, because it will take a lot of our time uh, from the main uh, Sira, the main five, six years which remain in Medina. The year seven and the six after Hijr are very, very important. If not the most important year in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So two things. The first thing I would like to mention 
is you are all aware, with, I was <coughs> talking about this issue a few, few days ago, the issue of slandering someone. And as we all know, there was a slander which took place against our mother, um, Umm al-Mu'min Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she left with, for one of the ghazawat with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for some reason she was delayed and she stayed behind and this actually caused a lot of grief for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much so that the wahi stopped. And no uh, eye was revealed. Some scholars say up to a month, some say more. Into the eye came and clearing uh, the izzah, the honor of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. This was really a test for the Muslims at that time in Medina. They were still getting, you know, the, the unity, the brotherhood was still fresh. But this was a major test. And unfortunately, some of the Muslims uh, failed this test. And amongst them, there were munafiqeen who caused this uh, the rumor who started this rumor off, and it was really a big test for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this took place in the year uh, 6 after Hijri, in the battle of Banil Mustalaq. And this was in the, in the month of Sha'ban, 6 after Hijri. And the, the issue of the slander of, Rasul, of, the, of the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a separate topic in itself, and we'll get into that inshallah sometime in the future. But just to make you aware of, of the background of it, it was during one of the battles that she stayed, she, she was left behind because she had lost one of her earrings and she was looking for her earring or her ring, one of the two. And this is something which we'll discuss in the future, inshallah. Moving forward to the sixth year after Hijrah in the month of Dhil Qaida. This is when the Prophet sallallahu sees a dream, a vision. And as we know, the dreams of the Prophets are true. They are, they are haq. And he sees himself doing uh, uh, leaving for Umrah, doing Tawaf, and he, and he gives this glad tidings to the Sahaba. And naturally, after seeing the dream, they leave for Makkah, in order to what? To make Umrah. And it is said that 1,500 men uh, and women, some women amongst them, left with no weapons. They had no weapons, they didn't leave to fight. They left to do Umrah. The, and the Qurayshi, they found out about the, the plan, about the coming of Rasulullah for Umrah, and naturally they didn't like this. So they stopped them uh, from coming uh, and they blocked them outside of Mecca. And this Wadi Hudaybiyah is a place where they actually the, the treaty was written between the Qurayshis and the Muslims of Medina. And interest, interest, uh, very, very interesting that one of the, the, the Quraysh leaders was uh, Khalid ibn Walid, who was still not a Muslim at that time. He became Muslim later on in the seventh uh, year after Hijri. So as the Muslims head into uh, Mecca, they are stopped, as I said, uh, and there's a deadlock. So there's no movement. They are, the Qurayshis are blocking their way, the, the Muslims are camping here. So Uthman ibn Affan is sent to uh, broker a peace. And Uthman ibn Affan goes and he, and he meets the elders of the Qurayshis. And then there's a rumor of his death, after which a pledge is taken by the Muslims that we will fight to the last one to avenge the death of Uthman ibn Affan, which turned out to be false in the end. And this is the first pledge which is mentioned uh, in the Qur'an, Qadr radiallahu anil mu'minina iz yubayi'unaka tahta shajarati So they made a pledge underneath a uh, tree, and even that tree is mentioned in the Holy Qur'an. Such important it was given to that event. And the first pledge was given that we'll fight to the last person. Khair, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu he returns back, uh, and he gives the, 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 uh, the uh, the news that I am still, you know, I haven't been heard in any way, and this was just a false rumor. Again, the Munafiqeen were, were, you know, were, were known to uh, create this stir amongst the Muslims and create false information. And then the Bay'atul Ridwan happens, the treaty between the Muslims and the, the Qurayshi. And there are many uh, points to this uh, treaty, which is a long treaty, about four or five points. But the, the main point of it was that the Muslims were to return today without performing Umrah. And this was really, a, a, again, another test for the Muslims after the, the test of the slander. This, this comes another test. And I want you to keep this in focus. How many tests did the Muslims face before the ultimate victory, which is the uh, victory at Fath, Fath Makkah? And one of the, the points in the treat is that uh, when returning uh, to, uh, for Umrah next year, for next year you will not come with any weapons, which was the case, they didn't come with any weapons, only what you need for your, for your daily uh, hunting, etc. Also, very, very important point which happened in this treaty, that the, the war activities between the Qurayshis and the Muslims stopped, and the, and the agreement was for 10 years. 
but it didn't last for 10 years. And this is why what resulted in the uh, return to Mecca in the Fatih Mecca. And again, there are many uh, sub-treaties which really didn't please the Muslims. Umar radiallahu anh, he actually says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, aren't you on the haqq? Shouldn't we just march on to uh, Mecca and, you know, and fight them? Uh, but no, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that I have written a treaty with them and I'm going to respect my, my word. I'm going to give them my word and I will come back the following year. And again, there are many disputes within the treaty that what the wording should be. Should it be Muhammad Rasulullah? Should it be Muhammad Ibn Abdullah? And many, Bismillah rahman rahim wasn't written down. And these were all done for the benefit of the, the wider community, the Muslims at that time. And again, we see uh, there's a treaty, there's a point in the treaty which says that if anyone joins the Muslims in Medina from the Qurayshi, and he's, he's either a slave or he's under the, uh, the ownership of one of the Qurayshis, he must be returned back. Other way around, no, it doesn't have to be uh, sent back. So if one, someone leaves from Medina, from the Muslims to the, to the Qurayshis, they don't have to send him back. So this was unfair towards the Muslim, but yet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa accepted the treaty for the benefit of the, of the whole community. And we see an instance where there's a, there's a Sahabi, uh, Suhail son Abu Jundan, and he arrives uh, at the time when the treaty has been written. He's chained up, he's beaten, and he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to seek refuge. In the, in the place of Hudaybiyah and the Sahabas, they become very emotional seeing the state of this Sahabi, how much he's been beaten, you know, he's been chained and he's been mistreated, but yet the Qurayshis <coughs> saw this as an opportunity to break the treaty. So naturally the Sahabis are emotionally charged and the Prophet ﷺ says to him, Ya Bujandan, have patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy for you and he actually sent him back to the Qurayshis. This is how much you know, nowadays we have a contract between ourselves, we don't take care of This is the contract which we can see that the, the person, our Sahabi, our brethren, is being uh, subjected to uh, bulim, but yet because we have something in writing, we must send him back in order to adhere and to respect the treaty. This is how our Prophet sallam, even to his enemies, was you know, true to his word. So we must take lessons from this, brothers and sisters in Islam. Again, this, this Sahabi Abu Jundal, he later joins the, uh, the Muslims in Medina after a few years, after his, uh, his freedom. But well, let's go through some lessons of Hudaybiyah, of Sulh Hudaybiyah, that you might think that Umar was so angry and he was so, you know, uh, heated that, you know, why should we give in to these mushrikeen, you know, and we hear this a lot, that, you know, we're on the haqq, why shouldn't we just go there and, and fight them? But straight away, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has a huzul uh, of the ayah, inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. This is Surah Al-Fat. Very Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already granted you victory through this Surah Al-Hadaybiyah. And you might think, how was this possible? How does this logically make sense? For the first time, one of the reasons the scholars, they say that for the first time, we, we see that the Qurayshis, they are taking the Muslims seriously as a political force, as a military force, and also as a community that, you know, are there to be reckoned with. I.e. They have, they have the respect is in the hearts for the, for the Muslims. And also we see that after this uh, Hudaybiyah uh, treaty, the Islam it flourished all over the land. Islam <laughs> flourished, people started entering into the religion in the hundreds, if not in the thousands. And you will see the numbers, when you compare the numbers from 1500, in Sulha Haidaybiyah, you compare it to how many were present in Fatih Makkah, you see how many new Muslims had arrived in, in, the, in the span of four to five years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, he, 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 he guided three very, very important figures in the history of Islam. Was, one of them was Khalid ibn Walid, Amr ibn al-As, and Uthman ibn Talha. Three great leaders of Islam uh, for, for the future had accepted Islam after the uh, seventh of uh, Hijri, and this was a great victory for them, because as we know, Khalid ibn Walid, he is considered one of the the greatest, uh, if not the greatest, commander at the time, and he he fought many uh, battles uh, during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and also after his departure from this world. So we move on, and this is really the end of the first phase in Medina. The first stage. We move on to the second stage which is in the 7th 
uh, year after Hijra. And this is when there's no, there's very minimal hostility between the Qurayshis because this was part of the treaty that we're not going to fight one another anymore. That's it, we had enough. And this is when the da'wah, the calling to Islam, started to the kings and the leaders of different uh, lands around the Muslim uh, uh, Medina. And it is known that some accepted, <coughs> others were, 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 were welcoming, but they didn't accept and others rejected it. So there's three types of uh, response to this da'wah call by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the various leaders. And he sent letters to the king of Abyssinia, uh, to Qisra and Qaisar, uh, and also the governor of Yemen. And all these were letters which were sent uh, with the seal of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have another very, very important uh, battle which is mentioned in the history books, which you all hear about, is the, is the Ghazwat al-Khaybar. And this is really uh, happens around Medina. So this is not with the Qurayshis, this is with the, uh, the, uh, the local Jews around Medina. So remember the, the treaty is that we don't fight one another, the Qurayshis and the uh, Medinans, the Muslims. But really Khaybar is an important strategic uh, land around Medina. It is about 60 to 80 miles north of Medina. And this took place in the month of Muharram, seven after Hijri. And really the Muslims at this time suffered a lot. They suffered from hunger, physical uh, tiredness. And there were about 1,400 Muslims who took, play, who took part in this battle. 14 to 18 were martyred and about 90 to 100 Jews were killed in this uh, battle. Now you, you, you hear of this uh, very, very important event which took place that they, they became so hungry that they had their donkeys and their other uh, mules and camels which they started to slaughter. The Prophet ﷺ gave strict orders that you're not allowed to eat the, the, the meat of the donkeys or the horses. And he told them to throw the meat away. Even though they were hungry, they, was, they, they were really, really uh, fatigued. But the Prophet ﷺ told them this is not for, to, uh, to be at, the, uh, the slaughtering of the donkeys and the horses is not allowed in the, uh, for us as halal uh, meat. <coughs> and we see that the Prophet ﷺ was also poisoned in this uh, battle by a Jewish woman, which he later complained about, and he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before his uh, de uh, departure from this dunya. And this was a Jewish woman who put some poison in the, in the, in the shoulder of a lamp, and, he, and she served him, sallallahu alayhi wa but he, he took a bite, and straight away he realized, and he spat it out. But there was still some effect left of this uh, poison. And after the, uh, the seventh of Hij after Hijri, we'll see uh, the following year after the Sulih Haidaybiyah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaves for the Umrah Qadai, the compensation Umrah, yeah, to make up what he uh, missed the following year. And he leaves with 2,000 men towards Mecca. And these were most men or women who, witnesses, who witnessed Hudaybiyah plus some other new believers. And they were there for three days, which was the agreement between the Qurayshis. They didn't stay there longer than three days, and they camped outside on the fourth day. And this is when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he marries uh, Maymuna, the daughter of Harith. He marries Maymuna bint Harith. This was in the seventh year after Hijrah in the Qadha Umrah, Umrah Qadha year. Following this uh, Qadha Umrah, we have the, the battle of Mut'a. Now this is also a strategic battle which happened in the northern borders. And yeah, this is really the most fiercest of battles that the Prophet himself witnessed. Battle of Mut'a. Ah. This took place in the eighth year of uh, Hijri. And this is really on the borders of Syria, Sham. Yeah, this, and, the, and the background to it, the why did the Muslims leave to, uh, to fight them, was because one of the, the carriers of the lectures, as we know, the Prophet sent letters to the kings, one of the messengers by the Prophet ﷺ, the carrier of the, of the letter, was killed by the governor of Balqa, who was called Shar Habib. And this was actually when you kill a messenger from a, another uh, land, another country, this is, this is directly you calling for war. So the Prophet ﷺ sent uh, Zayd ibn Haritha as the leader of the, of, the, of the army. And the Prophet ﷺ told him to reach the place where this murder had took place. And firstly, to do what? Not to engage straight into battle. This wasn't the way of Rasulullah He says, first you invite to Islam. If so, you don't fight them. If they accept the Islam, you don't fight them. And he also said, fight with the following advices. If you have to fight the enemy, how do you fight? 
He says, Uhzu wa uqtulu fi sabillah. Finding the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the name of Allah, firstly. Neither break a covenant that you have made with them, nor entertain treachery amongst yourself or on the opposite camp. And under no circumstances do you kill a newborn, a child, a woman, an elderly, who is not, who, is, who either is in combat or is not a combatant, either way. Nor entertain um, a killing of an aging man or a priest or someone who is in their worship place. Because don't forget, this area was mostly Christian. Yeah, this was the, the, the Byzantine Christian land. No aging man or priest or, or nun should be killed. Moreover, neither trees should be cut down. Trees, yeah, shajar, should be cut down, nor should the homes be demolished. And this is in time of war, brothers and sisters. Now, you imagine in times of peace, how much merciful was Rasulullah sallallahu that even the trees, he's worried about that this would give shahada against the, uh, the army of the Muslims. This is how, you know, when you look at it, that once you start going beyond the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I mentioned a few weeks ago, the barakah leaves you. And you will not find any help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you go killing people indiscriminately and cutting their trees, cutting, you know, you know bombarding their houses. Uh, may Allah protect us. And in this um, battle, Khalid ibn Walid was instrumental. And he was one of them who really fought uh, bravely in this battle of Mut'a. We follow on because we are fast forward into the next day now from 7th after Hijri. We're going to go straight up to 8th after Hijri. So remember this Ghazwa uh, Mut'a. I do not uh, confuse it with the word which is Mut'a. It's different to Mut'a. They both mean different things. Fathi Makkah comes along now. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is forced to go to Mecca. Tell you why. Because the treaty which he had in Hudaybiyah is broken. How is it broken, you may ask? There are some allies, which there are tribes which have been allied to the Muslims and also to the Qurayshis. Banu Bakr and uh, Banu Khuza. Banu Bakr is the ally of Qurayshi and Banu Khuza is the ally of the Muslims in Medina. And there's, there's actually a fight which breaks out between these two tribes. And Banu Bakr, the, the Qurayshi ally, kills some of the people uh, from Banu Khuza in the Haram. In, in Makkah, in Haram. And this is automatically a, uh, a transgression or an aggression, and it is a nullifier of the treaty. Yeah, this is basically you are saying that the treaty no more is in effect, and it gives the reason for the Muslims to, to march on Makkah. And we will see how they march on to Makkah, and you will really understand how much, you know, the Muslims at that time, how much love they had for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this uh, treaty is broken. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has made his mind up that I am going to march, march uh, on on Makkah when the permission is going, when the permission is given by Allah subhanahu wa taala. So Abu Sufyan he realizes that this is a, a big problem now. If the Muslims they arrive in Makkah in the numbers, we are finished. So he straight away he's not a Muslim by this, this time. Abu Sufyan is still a, a mushrik. He comes to Medina, starts to, you know, tries to appease the Muslims in order to calm them down, in order to calm the anger down so that they don't march on Mecca. None of the Muslims uh, respond to him. The Prophet has told them that we want a complete boycott, complete blockout of any information to lead to the Meccans. And this was a, a, a strategy that they used in order to uh, take them by surprise. And really, there was only one instance of, the, uh, of somebody trying to leak the, the information. But really, this person was also uh, Hatib. He was a Badri. He was somebody who actually fought in the Badr. Hatib, the only reason he sent the message to the Makkah is because he had family there and he wanted to warn them to leave Makkah because the Muslims are about to march on Makkah. He's brought, he's brought forward and Umar ibn Khattab, he wants to, you know, as usual, chop his head off, but he says, Prophet says to him, no, he is a Badri. He is somebody who has actually witnessed Badr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told those who are in Badr, do as you like, because what he did on that day will be enough to forgive any sin which you commit. How much, so much status has been given to the Badris, you know, those who fought in the Badr, Hatib. So the days pass, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts his march. With how many men you think? Because in, in Hudaybiyah it was how many? 3,000, 4,000. In the march of Fatih Makkah, some scholars they say it was 10,000. 
Others say it was more. And these are all new <coughs> reverts to the, to the religion. 10,000 is a big number. Even the Byzantines at that time didn't have five, 6,000 men to fight in their armies. The Byzantines, the, the Christian rulers. When did he start to leave? In the month of Ramadan, the 10th of Ramadan. So they were fasting. And when they left Medina, they were still fasting. In the 8th year after Hijri. So Abu, Abu Sufyan and his son, they know what's coming. So they go back to uh, Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ, it is a long narration which in itself will take the whole you know, hour. So I will just do the main, uh, mention the main headings of what happened during the, the event of Fatih Makkah. That you can, you can imagine 10,000 men and women entering into Makkah. And the Prophet ﷺ tells them that we are entering not as uh, fighters. We are there to liberate the, the land of Makkah from idol worshipping. This was the sole intention. And you know they didn't enter with any weapons. Uh, the, only, the only thing they took was the basic uh, weapons which they need for the hunting, etc. And you may ask yourself that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he entered and he only stayed there for 19 days. He didn't stay there uh, for more than 19 days. He performed his tawaf, his sa'i, his umrah, and he gave many uh, sermons during this uh, time. And really the Qurayshis were worried that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has entered uh, into Mecca. What he, will he do to us now? Because we have given him so much grief, so much uh, you know, taklif, so much problems you know, he's faced in Mecca. Now he's coming as, as victorious. What will he do to us? And he stands uh, beside the Kaaba and he addresses the Qurayshis that, Oh Qurayshis, you know, what do you think I should do to you? And they say to him, oh, Rasul, oh, oh Prophet, you are, you know, the son of the, the most generous, you are the, you know, the Sadiq, you are Amin, and we only expect good from you. You know, so they knew that he is a good person, he is a Prophet. And, they, and he says to them quite clearly that I say to you, same as what Yusuf al-Islam said, said to his brother, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم, there is no sin upon you today, I forgive you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that act of forgiving, forgiving itself, some scholars say, resulted in many of the Quraysh at that time becoming Muslim. Many at that time who witnessed the, uh, the forgiveness and the mercy of, Allah, of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was itself a da'wah. And again, this is a very, very important lesson for all of us that when we have the opportunity to forgive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we shouldn't hesitate. Because really the, the, the intention will be looked at the first instant. What comes to your mind? And, uh, it was your mind to forgive on the first instance or was you, did you have to think about it? And really we shouldn't hassle, we shouldn't really delay the forgiveness for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he stayed there for 19 days, uh, the Ansar start to get worried that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi has come back to his motherland, his homeland, because Makkah was dear to him sallallahu alayhi wa He loved Makkah. When he was leaving Makkah, he made many uh, you know, du'as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bless this land, you know, bless its inhabitants. The same way he made du'a for Medina, but his love was for his motherland, his homeland. So the Ansar started to uh, panic that may, maybe the Prophet ﷺ will stay here now and this will be his, uh, his uh, center. But no, he said, I have uh, come here, I have done what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me to do. And, he's, and he, obviously he entered into the Kaaba, he destroyed there about 360 idols. Ali ibn Abi Talib was with him and he got rid of all the, uh, the idols which were present in the, inside the Kaaba. And then he, he tells the Ansar that I am with you, you are with me at the time of, of distress or at a time of difficulties and I will go back with you to al madinatul al -Manawara. And this was something which made the, the uh, Sahaba very, very happy and rejoiced in the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu will come back with us to Madinatul al -Manawara. That was very, very brief, very, very quick. Uh, there was many details in there which I have missed. Uh, and also we have the, um, the, the, the event which took place of the, the Islam of Abu Sufyan and his uh, son. And, and he's also, you know, the, the person who killed his uncle Hamza, you know, you can imagine that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ was so hurt uh, of the death of Hamza, but yet when this person comes to him, Ikram uh, and Hind and Wahshi, Wahshi was the one who killed him, and Hind was the one who actually chewed his, uh, his liver, the liver of Hamza. Yet these people come to him and he says to them, you know, I've forgiven you, the hurt might be still there, but for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have forgiven you. And it is known that they became Muslim at this event, Fatih Makkah. The Azan has been made, the Azan is made in Makkah. They pray Salat there and all the, the rituals of, the, of Islam are uh, 
revived in the Haram. After so many years of no Salat, of no Tawaf, this has been revived. And this lead, leads us to the last stage of the life of Rasulullah in Medina. I will quickly wrap up in about 5-10 minutes, inshallah. There are, there are a few points in the last stage which are really uh, crucial. There are, there are some battles which took place uh, around Medi uh, Medina. And there are also the glad tidings which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that people will flock into the religion in rows in many numbers. And this is what happened. But we have the battle of Hunayn, which is mentioned in the Holy Quran, in Surah Tawbah, which, which took place in the eighth year after Hijjah in Shawwal. And this is really uh, one of the uh, greatest battles after Fatih Makkah. And in this there were 12,000 Muslims who marched upon Hunayn and uh, took control of this area. <coughs> and following the Hunayn, there was another battle called uh, Taif, the Battle of Taif, which was an extension of the Battle of Hunayn. This was led by Khalid ibn Walid, and they, they took control of the area for about 10 to 20 days, approximately. And during this time, there was a, a big tribe called the Hawazin, which were a, a very powerful tribe. At that time, they were still not Muslim, but following the, the campaign in Taif, they became Muslim later on. We follow, we follow this with the ninth year after Hijri, because only a couple of years left now for the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have the, the, the last ghazwa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone remember what it was, the, the last ghazwa which he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself took part? To part. Anyone has, has a clue? A rough guess? <coughs> okay. It was the ghazwa Tabuk in the month of Rajab, ninth after Hijri. And this was another war against the Byzantines in Sham, against Caesar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during this, uh, this ghazwa, uh, before this ghazwa, uh, he makes a vow to keep away from his wife uh, for 29, 30 days. And there's actually a, a, another a separate narration regarding this, which we'll go into the details later on, inshallah. But the, the beauty of this uh, battle is that it wasn't 10,000 Muslims who marched, it wasn't 20, it was 30,000 Muslims who marched on the, on the uh, borders of the Byzantine Empire. It was the largest empire at that time the Byzantines. And it happened that the, uh, because it was the la last ghazwa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah made it so that when he enters and when he goes to for, the, for the ghazwa, the, the, the battle is swift and the results are also quick as well. And this is really, again, another one of the lessons that after hardship that he went through early on in Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him two, three, four different victories in different battles. And this was a ghazwa which took place uh, before Ramadan. And you know the, the shi'r which you hear, Tala al Badru alayna, this is actually the shi'r which was recited after the return from this ghazwa, not when the hijrah was made. You know, we, sometimes we, we hear this, we, th we think it was, it was uh, proclaimed when the hijrah was, was done, it was rather than after this ghazwa, ghazwa uh, Tabuk. And really the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi wa sallam, after this ghazwa, he didn't leave Medina for any other battles. The 10th year of Hijri, we wrap up very, very quickly. Mu'adh ibn Jabal is sent to Yemen. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has indication that this might be his last year. Because he says to Mu'adh, Ya Mu'adh, you know, go to Yemen and go forth, you know, and preach uh, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it may be so that I will not see you next year. So he gives him a hint. And Mu'adh starts to uh, weep and cry. And he knows that this is really uh, my last meeting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are many other instances when the ayahs reveal إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْلُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ But this is also a, a sign that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hasn't got long uh, to stay in this uh, temporary world. The last major event, what, what have we missed so far? The main event. Anyone remember what the main event? Any clues? The Hajj. Because this is the only Hajjat al Wida. The farewell pilgrimage is the last event, the major event in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So this happens in the month, uh, in, the, in the 10th of, uh, uh, after Hijri. And this really is an eye-opener because the numbers, uh, subhanAllah, are staggering. The numbers are just uh, unbelievable. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from 313, and you go up to how much? Hun over 100,000, how many years? Subhanallah. This is the time, you know, no leader can, can claim 
to have achieved this in such a small amount of time. You know, we go back to Barakah. This is what you call the Barakah of the Prophets and the Rasul and the Messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's very, very quickly, I finish off on this Hujjah uh, al He leaves on the Saturday of the 26th, 27th of Dhul Qaeda, which is the month before Dhul Hijjah. And he enters Mecca, the 4th of Dhul Hijjah. He does his Umrah in the month of uh, Dhul Hijjah, the normal Umrah. And on the 8th, he goes to Mina, as is the rituals of the Hajj, 8, 9, 10. After sunset, he, le he leaves and he gives the farewell ser sermon in Arafah. And this is when the ayah was revealed, Al Yom Akmantu Lakum Deenakum, Wa Asmamtu Alaykum Ni'mati Wa Raditu Lakum Islam. This is the last ayah according to majority of the Mufassirin, which was revealed. And this was really the, 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 the closing statement, as you can say, in front of approximately over 100,000 Muslims who witnessed. And the Prophet Sallallahu made each one of them witness that have I done my, basically my job, have I done my duty, have I, you know, uh, have I conveyed the truth, have I conveyed Islam, and they all say, Bala, you have conveyed the truth. So, Ali Yawmaikman was the first, uh, was the last ayah, and after the Hajjatul Midah, this was the only Hajj that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed. Yes, so one Hajj is Sunnah, and he did many Umrahs, four or five Umrahs, you know, so this was really uh, you know, one of the, the greatest of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he does the farewell tawaf after the ayam al tashrit uh, So the Hajj was basically initiated at that time. This is how the Hajj became to be known as it is in our times, as a Sunnah. This is how it was recorded by various narrators of Hadith. And this is how we see it in the Hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, etc. He leaves, uh, he does the farewell uh, tawaf uh, and then he leaves for Medina. And after the 10th of, uh, of Hijri, he's, he, he's not, he's, that year he, he stays in Medina. And this week we go up to actually one battle which is uh, fought by uh, one of the, the commanders. The Prophet stays uh, in Medina until his, uh, his farewell from this uh, temporary world. Which inshallah, uh, if Allah wills, we will go through in details. Because his, his uh, final uh, journey is actually a lesson in itself as well. It has really beautiful... Remind us for all of us of how his death was presented to him. How his death was presented to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I hope I have covered most things uh, in, in, in summary. If I have left anything out, then I really encourage you to go and uh, pick up a book of Sira and start reading. Don't think that Rabi al-Awwal has just finished now. We are entering the month of Rabi al-Thani. But it shouldn't be the end of Sira. You should carry on with this practice of reading a page, two page a day. And inshallah, within a year you will finish any sira book which you find which is you know uh, easy for you to read, pick it up, read it, and inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring barakah with it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the straight path. May He bring the true love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into our hearts. And may we really be guided by the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and try to take examples from his life, O oh, brothers and sisters Islam, because very there's no one better than him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take, you know, as a role model as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a leader, as a warrior, as, 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 a, as, a, as a ruler. We cannot take anyone better than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aqulu qawli hadha, astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa il muslimi fa astaghfiru, innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. Inshallah, as I mentioned, next week we will have...